So this is AJ Klein with the Council of Canadians. I'm the Pacific Regional Organizer. We're joined here with Eric Doherty, who is a member of our Victoria, BC chapter, and ATU President John Danino. And they're going to be talking about um, intercity bus service and Dylan will be touching on the Green New Deal. Really a, a key part of what we're grappling with here tonight and with the, the campaigning uh, we're doing at the Council around a Green New Deal is the question of who's going to decide our future. Is it going to be corporations or is it going to be people and communities? And we've seen what happens when we leave critical decisions to corporations and the volatility of the market with the oil crash that's happening currently. And we've also seen it with the cuts to intercity bus service, as well as a long uh, list of, of other uh, situations where, where people and communities have been left behind uh, in the pursuit of profits. And really fundamentally, this system needs to change because if we don't ensure that justice is centered in these decisions, we're going to keep seeing more and more injustices and those are going to be compounded uh, with the interconnected crises that we're, we're facing in terms of the climate emergency, growing inequality, the rise of racism and white supremacy, and now the emerging global health emergency and likely a, a global recession. So, so solving these crises really requires a social and, and economic transformation. And the oil crisis that the world is currently entering and the crisis of cuts to intercity bus services both really underscore why we need a, a Green New Deal. And, and so the question is, uh, how do we get there? And we're going to be talking a little bit about that tonight. There's significant institutional resistance to implementing a federal Green New Deal. And to win a Green New Deal will require changing the balance of forces in order to change what's possible. And so at the Council of Canadians, uh, an important part of the work that we're doing to address that is to build local Green New Deals in our communities by supporting local community organizing. Our view is that movements can wield significant influence in our communities. And we want to build power in our communities to force the transformative change that we need at the local level. And we can, we think we can build that momentum and local organizing capacity uh, and leverage that to, to ensure we ultimately get a federal Green New Deal as well through the kinds of municipal and regional organizing that we can do and the kind of great organizing that's happening around intercity bus service. And, and another key consideration is that municipalities control about 44% of emissions in Canada. So, so there is a substantial uh, climate impact as, as well. And a key part of this organizing uh, to connect the, is to connect the dots between the need for affordable, accessible public intercity, suburban and urban transit as part of the just transition that we need to address the climate crisis in an equitable way. And, Given the scale of emissions evolve, involved and how deeply it affects millions of people, transportation really needs to be a central part of the Green New Deal. In terms of the general work uh, that we're doing at the Council to, to build Green New Deal uh, communities, in addition to transportation, we're also working with people and movements and communities from coast to coast to build Green New Deals that also address infrastructure, including housing and municipal and, and commercial, as well as land use planning and reining in developers and public services in, in general and, and building a future with low carbon jobs, as well as indigenous rights, equity, democracy, and food, water, and agriculture are, are key to a, a low carbon uh, future as well in terms of how we, how we manage them in an equitable way and of course energy and electricity so uh, fundamentally we we do want to uh, build local green new deals that include uh, municipal and, and regional action but it, it's not just about winning resolutions and, and uh, ultimately at the federal level it's not just about winning legislation it's about building the kind of communities we want and the kind of future and the kind of world we want uh, and win or lose contributing to building the community power to win the greater climate ambition and just transitions uh, that we need for our communities. And, and so through building that upward pressure and, and ultimately uh, contesting 
corporate power locally. That means we're we're choosing a terrain of struggle where corporate interests are weaker and our communities are, are stronger. And so our presenters this evening will explore what transforming our approach to intercity bus service, uh, intercity public bus service can look like as part of a Green New Deal and, and part of the future uh, that we need. And we look forward to talking with all of you about how we can make that happen. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. And now it's time for us to be joined by Eric Doherty. Eric, over to you. Thanks, AJ. Um, I just want to start by um, uh, telling you about a little, just a little bit about myself. I live in Victoria, BC, um, but like a lot of people who live in cities in uh, Canada, I've got family in a, in a smaller rural area um, near 100 Mile House, BC. And um, I didn't used to think that the Greyhound bus service was so great. Um, it's, uh, you know, but it did the job. Uh, what we've got now on that route is something that is actually quite a bit worse. And um, I'm gonna start my presentation and uh, dig into that. Okay. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that, uh, that I'm uh, speaking to you from unceded Lekwungen territory in the midst of the uh, beautiful Salish Sea. Um, and also just mention that a fair number of the pictures I'm gonna be showing are from a, uh, a trip I took to Europe um, in 2018, where I spent a fair bit of time trying to uh, um, find examples that have real relevance for uh, Canada. Um, and not just the big city. Uh, this particular photo was from a, a small town um, called Umeå in Sweden, which is about um, um, about the latitude of uh, Prince George and uh, quite a different uh, city from Prince George Web. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the situation we're in that you probably already know the basics of, but um, also wanted to flag that when it when there was the first the cancellation of Greyhound, there was quite a bit of media attention on this problem, the impacts on First Nations community, on seniors, on youth, on safety. Um, but that's largely dried up. Um, but the situation hasn't gotten better for people. Uh, the context that we're in. Um, it's also, you know, as framed by the, the Pact for a Green New Deal, it was that we have less than 10 years left to cut our emissions in half. Uh, otherwise, we're facing these really catastrophic uh, impacts. Um, and I think it's important to note that, that our emissions aren't really going down. They're stuck at a very high plateau. And the main reason for that is the two big sectors, uh, oil and gas and transportation, uh, our governments have been spending very large amounts of money on things that drive emissions up. So logically, our emissions have been going up um, and we're looking at an increase of 43% from 1990 to 2017 in the transportation sector. And the way this works is pretty simple. Uh, if you spend billions of dollars on wider roads in big cities, they just fill up. The biggest driver of increased emissions in the transportation sector in Canada and many countries around the world is spending on urban highway expansion. Uh, and this does a number of different things. One thing it doesn't do it doesn't make people commute easier. It doesn't make them faster. Um, what it does is it makes people's lives less satisfying, shorter, increases the commute time, increases exposure to air pollution, social isolation. And interestingly, it also makes uh, people more susceptible to the corporate media. And um, I don't know if you've all heard this, but uh, the typical Trump uh, voter, one of the characteristics that they have is a lack of sidewalks. And that indicates a lack of ways to get around other than by driving. 
And we've also got um, government money going in a big way into increasing um, greenhouse gas pollution from the, the aviation sector. This is just one of many examples. Vancouver International Airport is planning on spending $9.1 billion over 20 years. Um, and this is largely to accommodate short and medium distance flights. The same flights that could be easily replaced by passenger rail or highway bus. And um, yeah, our climate pollution is up uh, 65% in 2005 levels. And at the same time, this is the same time as even when we had Greyhound bus service, it was being cut back, it was getting more expensive, it was getting less convenient. Uh, and every dollar that goes into highway or airport expansion, um, that's public money. It can be used in any way that the public decides to use it. And interestingly, um, the uh, 2016 Federal Provincial Climate Agreement actually acknowledged this. They acknowledged right in the text that airport and highway expansion uh, increase greenhouse gas pollution. And they committed to change this, to shift this money away from those things that increase pollution to public transit, uh, walking, cycling, things that reduce greenhouse gas pollution. Um, of course, it hasn't happened. And so basically, if governments are actually forced to implement their own policy and stop spending money on urban highway expansion, there'll be billions of dollars a year available. Um, of course, that's not enough to, for the whole Green New Deal package that we need. But there's also huge room for wealth taxes in this country and as the photo shows, uh, even the rich kids are in favor of higher taxes. So if you were to think about just the $9.1 billion that is, our government is planning on spending on expanding Vancouver's airport for short haul flights, which are the most polluting form of transportation available. What would $9.1 billion look like if it went into highway bus service. I can tell you, the buses could be really nice. The stations could be really nice. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I'm focusing on highway bus service is it's something that can be done quickly. We could have highway bus service operating within a matter of months once decisions are made. I just wanna flag that this is uh, this is one of the nicer buses I rode in uh, in Europe. Uh, I took a trip from Berlin to Copenhagen on this bus, uh, full day bus trip, and it was really nice. Uh, I got to see to sit right at the front. It even has windshield wipers for the passengers on the top deck. Um, and I also want to flag that uh, that the Overemphasis, which has happened in some discussions of the Green New Deal, the overemphasis on, on high speed rail has a real potential to divide the city from rural areas and small towns. Uh, this has actually happened in Europe, where high speed rail has been um, uh, improved, but the high speed rail only serves the biggest city and the rural areas have been left behind. Some uh, areas of France, for example, their bus service at, um, was cut back and the fares went up at the, the same time and very fancy, very nice new high-speed rail lines are being built. So I just wanna put out there that um, there is this temptation to, to focus on the really fancy mega project, the biggest of the project, but there's a danger on that. We need real Canada on board. So the Green New Deal needs to work for real for rural Canada. <laughs> and to some degree, we can look to um, places like Sweden where, uh, where passenger trains do serve small cities. Uh, this is the, uh, the photo here is of a, um, a workshop uh, on the train 
going at about 160 kilometers an hour heading north from Stockholm into to northern Sweden. Um, conventional trains, which are an affordable option, sleeper trains, um, those can be, uh, those can actually serve the smaller um, cities. And that's happening in um, all across uh, Northern Europe now. Countries are starting to talk about improving their conventional rail system, um, doing more with uh, sleeper trains, all the things that actually work for, for small communities and people who live in cities. I also want to flag that almost all of Europe and Asia have uh, electrified all the, the rail lines. If you want to make a project that brings the, um, the country together, think about how many jobs would be involved in electrifying both rail lines, major rail lines from coast to coast, jobs in every province of the country. But again, there's, um, there's some real challenges with rail, uh, high cost, long timeline, and just the fact that right now, most of our rail time is taken up with bulk commodities like oil and coal. As we phase out the use of fossil fuels, it opens up those, uh, that track time, but that will take a little bit of time, whereas um, buses are just quicker. Uh, lower capital costs, lower political barriers. We already own the roads. We don't have to nationalize the roads from a, a railway company to get full control of them. And fast results are crucial for, for building political momentum behind the Green New Deal. Um, there's also a lot of good fits with other Green New Deal proposals, like uh, the proposal, uh, delivering community power proposal, of um, using post offices as community hubs, multi-purpose community hubs with um, electric charging. If that's also where the bus depot is, it makes that hub all the more viable. And the bus is a way of moving people, but also moving mail. Um, and I think it's also really important for us to acknowledge just how bad the situation is in rural Canada with the with the highway bus, um, with the lack of highway bus, and also the various constituencies that we can get on board for a Green New Deal because of that. Seniors um, want to get to medical appointments. They want to get to family. Uh, they don't want to drive at night on snowy highways. Youth often unable to, to access education if they live in smaller communities. Indigenous people, Indigenous people live in rural areas, and if they don't, they have even stronger ties to rural Canada if they're living in cities than um, the rest of the population. Lots of groups who can be mobilized behind the Green New Deal. Uh, safety from, from violent crime is really it's a big thing that actually got us some highway bus service to replace Greyhound in northern BC. Um, there was a highway of tears, indigenous, young indigenous women being murdered and going missing. That's what brought on the push, uh, the political uh, pressure that got us BC bus service um, for northern BC. But this problem isn't isolated to northern BC. Uh, it's everywhere across Canada in rural areas. And road safety is also a huge concern all the way across Canada. Uh, moving to highway bus has a huge safety benefit. And uh, in particular, because it takes the highest risk drivers off the road disproportionately uh, and reduces crashes. And I just want to point out that this was, um, these are pictures I took this, uh, this winter on a trip up to um, to uh, visit my family. And this is what it's like every winter. There's all of us who, who travel Canadian highways, see the, the carnage and the, the air ambulances and all of these, uh, all of these indications of how many people are being killed and injured on our highways. 
Um, I want to just flag that the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and the Wilderness Committee has a report with a lot of these basic uh, ideas in it, in a, in a big picture way. I worked on that um, almost 10 years ago now. So we've got a quest, you know, we've got a, um, a decision point that we're at. Either we act decisively and get to the, the just and prosperous future for all of us, or we keep going the way we're going and descend into the chaos. Um, and I also want to flag that the, the young people who are pushing hardest for climate action are also very ready and willing to move away from the automobile society. Um, they're re ready to leave automobile ownership behind in particular. Uh, vehicle ownership is down uh, very start, very uh, rapidly all the way across Canada. Quebec has some of the best data where, there, where um, young men, uh, vehicle ownership went down 20% in just five years. And um, beyond the small communities, I want to raise the issue of seniors everywhere in Canada. Um, we've got a growing population of, of seniors, many of whom still drive, but don't drive at night don't want to drive long distances on highways and want to live in communities where they can um, where they can be active. And that means um, investing big time in paratransit, handy dart in BC is what we call it, um, services for door-to-door uh, -door, um, transit, which is uh, um, greatly underfunded in BC. Uh, it also means building sidewalks. It also means making sure that, um, that the bicycle facilities that we build are actually accessible to people using mobility scooters and wheelchairs. Oh, yeah. And actually, of course, all of these things, if you can't get to a highway bus, it's of no use to you whatsoever. Um, and I, I just wanted to bring up a quote because I'm going into a section about reducing the number of cars quickly, um, is that uh, it's become very obvious that we need to reduce the number of cars and the amount of driving in our city. But that doesn't happen unless people can get out of the city uh, without owning a car. Um, And the, the, um, the studies that we've seen and the experiences we've seen out of Europe and Asia and North America everywhere is that where there's less road space, people drive less. They switch to transit. Um, I've got uh, citations underneath of all of these slides coming up. Um, another one from Europe, traffic disappears or evaporates. Uh, and Reductions in roadway capacity tend to produce social and economic benefits without worsening traffic congestion. All of this stuff has led to cities like Paris, like Amsterdam, like Vancouver, deciding that they're gonna shift road space away from the private automobile, particularly into uh, cycling and transit lanes. And in this, in this case, uh, the city of Vancouver is planning to greatly reduce dependence on fossil fuels through a reduction in vehicle ownership and kilometers traveled by vehicle. Uh, they're aiming for a um, uh, to go from uh, to two thirds trips by active transportation up from half today in only ten years. And of course, the private automobile takes up a lot of room in our city and people don't take up a lot of room, which is why the transit bus is such a remarkable uh, way of creating space for other things in our cities and making cities nicer. 
And once um, you get a transit bus in a bus lane, that can move five to 10 times as many people as a lane of car traffic. And cities all over the world are doing just that. Um, this presentation, if you're interested in any of the information, uh, is based on this article, Green New Deal must include a transportation transformation and it's available at nationalobserver.com. And just as we're shifting to, um, uh, to John's presentation and then discussion, I wanna flag that um, I believe that the Council of Canadians is one of the organizations that really best uh, position to, uh, to reach rural areas, small city, and also connect to the city, to, to, to the bigger city uh, on the issue of a Green New Deal that works for everyone. And I also just want to, to close up by pointing out that um, until recently, this, uh, this lovely linear park in uh, Paris was a crowded highway. Um, we're going to uh, need to um, make a lot of changes that might seem impossible until they're done, but people are doing some things that uh, seemed impossible until they were done in other cities all over the world. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, John, I believe, let, let me unmute you here. Um, yeah, John, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to be here this evening on this uh, very important topic. So let me start off by saying um, who ATU Canada is. So ATU Canada is a labor union in, in this country representing 34,000 workers from coast to coast. We represent operators, maintenance staff, ticket takers, the transit professionals who move nearly um, 160 million rides per month. That's a huge number. Um, and so, you know, I took, I took over in 2018 as the ATU Canada president. And shortly after my election and uh, my introduction into a new position, I was faced with the reality of the announcement of the exodus of Greyhound in Western Canada. Um, and in very quick fashion, we mobilized at ATU Canada and took our fight to Ottawa. Uh, and we went and we met with the Minister of Transportation, Mark Garneau. Disturbing, but not unexpected. Uh, the federal government really had no interest in what we had to say in our fight for those good paying jobs and in what appeared to us as leaving millions of riders stranded in Western Canada. Um, we sat and we chatted for quite some time. A lot of commitments were made, but nothing was delivered in the end. Uh, and, you know, as the previous speaker, Eric, a lot of the decision makers um, do what they have to do, but don't consult the actual people that use the service and don't really care, in my opinion, on what that impact looks like. So understanding that we had a crisis on our hands, um, ATU Canada uh, decided that we needed to do something. We needed to understand what our citizens and the riders were faced against and what that reality looked like. Um, and so when you're lobbying with governments, they always think that we're doing it from a union perspective and we're only after looking at employment for our workers. But we wanted to put real people, real names and real faces uh, behind what this looked like for us and what people were saying. So what we did um, is we looked at the exodus of Western Greyhound and we understood that it had an immense human cost. Access to mobility, the freedom, community, family, healthcare, and all of the other public services that were at risk for millions of Canadians across this country. Uh, and to help us establish what that looked like, um, what we did was we teamed up with an audio uh, documentarian uh, by the name of Emily Liedman of Rank and File Radio. Some of you may know who she is. Uh, and she produced, in conjunction with ATU Canada, an hour-long uh, documentary. That documentary is entitled Still Waiting for the Bus, 
the unnatural death of prairie inner city transit. If you want to view it, you can view it at atucanada.ca. So some of the things that we learned, which we knew, but we wanted to reaffirm, is what we heard from all of those people who were affected. Um, Eric alluded to some of the things that we would have been discussing, but you know we spoke to Indigenous riders um, who require that service to get to medical appointments, their social visits to and from work. We spoke to, uh, to students in universities who relied on this service to get them home on the weekends, to help work the farms that their parents were working on and could no longer do that. Um, we heard from the women's shelters and, and we understood how many women were seeking refuge from abusive partners, but couldn't afford any other form of transportation like taxis to get to where they needed to be. Um, you know, we heard from riders who were very, very uneasy and disturbed by getting into things like Uber and ride sharing programs when the service was unregulated. And they knew quite well that they were uncomfortable because they weren't sure that those people operating those vehicles had gone through the necessary training and were actually professional drivers, um, you know, who were licensed and were insured to, to move them to where they needed to be. We also heard what was really, really interesting to us. We heard from a researcher who was looking at the psychosocial impact of being unable to connect with family, with loved ones, and who individuals were forced to change their lifestyle dramatically and, neg and negatively. It impacted how they lived every day. Um, and I guess from our perspective in the labor force, it was, it was absolutely concerning when our transit professionals, you know, almost a thousand of them lost their jobs through the exodus of Greyhound in Western Canada, the demise of STC in Saskatchewan. Uh, we were never consulted uh, as stakeholders in how that was going to look, but we have operators, transit professionals who call us regularly saying, you know, I used to service that route and there was a sick person who was going for cancer treatments and I don't know what happened to them anymore. I'm not sure how they got to and from their medical appointments. And we're concerned about those people that they moved every day because those transit professionals, those operators built relationships with those people. They built relationships where, you know, if the bus was supposed to be at a certain stop at a certain time, they would wait a minute or two extra so that that sick individual who needed that service would make it on time. They would stop on unscheduled routes to make sure that people could get in and off the bus when they had some physical challenges in inclement weather. Um, our operators have taken this very, very personal and it's affected a lot of them and the impact not knowing on where their riders have gone to. You know, some of the things that we learned is that with the exodus of these services in Western Canada, there has been no thought by any level of government on wanting to reintroduce this service throughout Canada. Quite frankly, when I met with levels of government, they said, it's a provincial issue. We'll let the provinces decide on how this is going to look. And we're gonna shift to private contractors because it's more cost effective. Well, the reality is, is that those unprof or sorry, those um, private transit companies are only after the profitable routes. And transit shouldn't be about profit. It should be about moving people to and from where they need to go. And, you know, where they have failed is that they have not allowed for integration of transit between communities. You know, I stood on the corner in Winnipeg watching a minivan, which was the replacement for Greyhound coming from Thunder Bay and driving through Northern Thunder Bay into Winnipeg. Um, and it, it didn't have wheelchair access. 
it didn't cater to the people living with disabilities. These are real people and real lives affected. And when I saw that van pulled up, pull up, I mean, quite frankly, I was totally appalled. And the disrespect that the government has, has given the taxpayers and, and the riders of this country are, in my, in my opinion, um, second to none. And we don't deserve that. And our riders don't deserve that. Um, we look at transit, not just about the good paying job. Although it is part of everyday living in this country, it's part of what we should be um, achieving in order to have sustainable livelihood. But we need to look at transit, and this is why we're here today, um, through a new lens. And that lens is a Green New Deal with a just transition. I will say very frankly that coming out of the transit sector for 32 years, being tied up in a shop uh, as a maintenance employee, I never really saw outside the box until I entered a new role and started to see the dynamics. And, and I started to see what that audio documentary really meant. Um, and I wish that you know politicians would go and, and watch our documentary and understand how many people's lives are being really affected. But you know, we looked at it through a new lens. Um, and today is the time where unions have to be part of this new initiative with community groups like the Council of Canadians to try to afford that change across this country. I will say this, it is an uncomfortable space as a transit professional representing workers to educate our members on what a just transition looks like. It is an uncomfortable space for us to talk about moving away from fossil fuels and going into new technology. Uh, new technology that has um, insecurities in terms of what our work is going to look like. And quite frankly, what we've heard is that new initiatives with battery electric buses and low emission vehicles are things that are gonna result in privatization. Again, it's gonna take us down a very dangerous road and like we saw the exodus of Greyhound and the closure of STC. But I think this is a real opportunity for ATU Canada, uh, moving 160 million rides a month, having 34,000 workers across this country to be part of that dialogue in what a Green New Deal looks like with a just transition. And so when Eric talked about investing in railway lines and electrifying those, look, the electrification of vehicles is not new technology. In fact, it's recycled technology. When I started at the age of 19 in the city of Toronto, we had trolley buses running on electricity, rubber, rubber wheeled buses. The technology has evolved. All we have to do is invest in training our workers, the next generation, what that transition is going to look like and how we adapt to that transition. Um, and I don't think it's a huge investment. And quite frankly, I don't think that there should be a price tag on what that change looks like. Because at the end of the day, the just transition in a Green New Deal is about our families, our loved ones, the earth we live on. We can ill afford to do nothing. And we're prepared at ATU Canada to send that message, work with all of, all of the advocacy groups, all of the community groups, to help deliver that message. Some will say, and some have said, well, what is the cost of the transition? How much is it gonna cost us to make that transition? My response to that is, and my response to the decision makers is, what is it gonna cost not to do it? Our climate, our earth, our loved ones and our children are, will be the recipients of our neglect. Um, ATU Canada is willing and is on board. Um, we, have, we have some great staff that's working on the initiative, debriefing us on a regular basis, educating even myself on what this looks like 
uh, and with groups like the Canadian Council and Eric Doherty and all of the advocacy groups, I think this is the time where we can make that change. Um, so we have a couple of slides, just as some of the work we did when I actually went out to um, Winnipeg in, uh, and, and moved across Northern Winnipeg. I wanted to see for myself what had really happened out there and trying to understand how vulnerable and how people were affected. Um, so what we ask is if you're, if you're listening, you can go to our website again, you can look at um, the audio doc at uh, atucanada.ca. On there, we also have a pledge that we would encourage you to sign that we can use in some of our accuracy work. Um, uh, this is um, this picture that you're looking at is a picture that was taken by Emily Liebman. Um, and you know, it, it's a telltale picture. We're looking at what used to be a community driven bus on that route. Um, and our, our young ones and our people and our vulnerable in low income families um, don't have that service. Have to walk in sub zero temperatures and in an inclement weather um, and have to get to where they have to go without any safe, reliable, affordable transit. I had, um, while we were out there, we actually um, looked at the first Greyhound bus. It was called Northern Bus Lines in Winnipeg that was servicing and we were able to procure this bus. This bus goes back to the 50s. This is something that's been part of our history and part of what we do and how we move Canadians. And these buses are now gone. Hugely troubling. Uh, again, it's another picture of the bus. Uh, I'm there with Emily Lieben, who actually did the audio documentary for us. Um, wonderful young lady. She did great work for us. Really able to capture what um, people are talking about and what they're missing with inner city transit. And I was out there with the MLA. We did a couple of press conferences. Uh, trying to build some momentum. And we have a real opportunity right now in Saskatchewan with the provincial election coming forth in the next couple of months, uh, ATU Canada will be out there working and demanding the restoration of STC in Saskatchewan. Over 200 communities that have suffered the loss of inner city transit in, uh, in Saskatchewan. Um, and this picture you see now is in Brandon, Manitoba. This is the old Greyhound terminal. It was eerie to see nothing there. Nothing, an abandoned station, the lifeline for Brandon to the rest of Winnipeg has been cut. Those images for me were life-changing. You know, I'm fortunate I live in a city, the city of Toronto, where public transit is readily available. It was difficult for me to understand what not having a transit service means until I actually saw that picture and stood there, as the documentary says, still waiting for the bus. And finally, you know, um, Eric has, had said it as well. Look, transportation is a human right. Uh, we c the market can not afford to have inner city transit. We know that transit jobs are green jobs. We need more of them, not less. And I think um, every level of government, every citizen has to be pushing for an investment in um, a Green New Deal with a just transition for Green New Jobs. Um, we can ill afford not to do it. Um, this is also, you know, the social impact, the environmental justice, and of course, the reconciliation with the Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, we'll go ahead and launch right into a couple questions. Um, we have Louise Leclerc, who is saying, does it promoting buses singularly or overarchingly mean that this will promote the idea that we need to continue building and putting money into highways? Who'd like to take that one? Um, I wouldn't mind taking that. Um... Okay, and Eric, if you want to as well, after one, you're more than welcome. So you don't have to create new highways. If you create new opportunities for buses, 
we can, we can fix those issues with giving those buses designated right of ways. Understand that, you know, for every bus out there with 50 passengers, we're taking 20 or 30 cars off the road. We can transition that traffic pattern into a designated right of way to afford our, our riders fast, reliable service uh, on a bus that has its own right of way. Eric. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, echoing what, what John said, that um, uh, that have bus service, uh, you don't have to have new wider highways. Um, it's about maintaining the existing highways uh, that we have. And we're going to need to do that anyway. Uh, these highways, uh, they're there. Um, and there's actually a very good uh, long-standing um, proposal from the uh, Sierra Club in the United States called Fix It First, which is about shifting money away from the highway expansion to maintaining roads um, in good condition. Thanks, Eric. Um, we have Gordon Winch saying, how does the push for free transit in cities like Toronto factor into expanded bus service and the Green New Deal? Who'd like to take that one? I could take that. Um, I, I think that uh, that definitely a Green New Deal needs to be about affordable public transit. Whether or not that's free, that's, a, that's an open question. But uh, what we do need to be focusing on is much better public transit, uh, particularly in our city, uh, getting dedicated lanes for transit. And we've seen that in, in Toronto with the, um, with rail vehicles and real success of, uh, of making more space for, for transit vehicles and getting the ridership way up. But we also need to be looking at, um, fares going on a downward tra trajectory, not an upward one. At, affordable fares absolutely have to be part of the Green New Deal. I, I d thank you, Eric. I, I'd just like to add on that. Um, you know, that's an interesting question, but I will say this. In the city of Toronto, the municipality subsidizes the TTC at about 78 cents a ride. The rest of the money comes out of the fare box. If you just go north of the city in York region, the region subsidizes the transit at 450 a ride, five times the cost, not including what's being paid at the fare box. And that is going to a private contractor and that money is then being taken outside of this country. If we could translate those, that kind of money into regular transit, we are going to reduce the price, maybe potentially have free transit at very or little cost and encourage more people onto a bus to encourage and move away from, um, from our vehicles. And really that would be the first step in the climate change and reducing carbon emissions. Thanks, John. Dylan, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, just a little bit. Uh, thanks for the the question. I, I think they that both the push for free transit in in a number of municipalities and and the need for expanded uh, bus service uh, uh, can and should be part of a, a green new deal. We really need a, a far reaching transportation transformation that that connects all the different places people are are in and places that people need to to go including rural urban and, and suburban transportation and what we're seeing is there's already a hundred municipalities around the world that have uh, free transit to some degree or other and there are some really exciting campaigns locally happening in in Canada at the moment including in, in Ottawa and Toronto and in Edmonton and, and other places as, as well and and the kind of uh, organizing potential that's there uh, in terms of connecting those campaigns and and the campaign for for intercity uh, bus service as, as part of as part of an overarching uh, need for for improved uh, affordable accessible public transportation as, as part of the green new deal that we need can be can be really powerful and and perhaps part of what we can talk about here and and what we can talk about 
uh, moving forward is, is how we can do the kind of organizing that that brings all of these communities together that are that are doing this great work to win the future that we need. We have a few more questions here and go ahead and keep typing your questions in folks. We have plenty of time. So Keith Wiley says, although it is important to seniors, youth and the differently abled people, isn't a national plan a hard sell politically? How can we put a big burr under the saddle of the political elites? Who wants to take that one? I think actually that it is the, um, the climate emergency that needs to be hit on here to, uh, to get uh, people in the cities on board with this and to get people, you know, broadly across society uh, on board with this. Uh, the fact is, is that without tra transforming our transportation system, we can't uh, deal with the climate emergency. We're going to be dealing with that, you know, that graph that we've got of uh, emissions going up and up and up, and maybe plateauing, but not going down steeply like we need to have them if we're going to survive as a, as a human society. So I think really what, what we have to do is, is recognize that this is an emergency. This is an emergency even more than this, uh, the, the, the virus that everybody is talking about and is the governments that we are willing to shut down airports. They're willing to, to shut down schools. They're shut down factories all these things for a, um, a very serious health crisis, but a health crisis that has uh, much, much, much smaller threat to human society than the climate emergency. Does anybody else want to take a stab at that one or should we move on to the next question? Look, um, here's what I'm going to say. Um, it's very hard to change political mindset, um, but we have the ability to do that. And how we do it is we lobby, we go out and advocate. We have to put, the, we have to put their feet to the fire. Look, as I said earlier, uh, when I was speaking, for myself, it was a very uncomfortable space and maybe not a popular one amongst my members to talk about a Green New Deal and changing the kind of work that they do. But if it's in our heart, um, I don't care whether I never get, if I ever get reelected again, it is about this, it's about our world. And we have to hold our, our decision makers as accountable as my members will hold me. Um, so only we can make that push. Uh, we know far too well that when we leave the decisions up to the decision makers, they have failed us. So let's go pressure them. Thanks for that, John. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. This is from Mark Beeching. He says, privatization in handy art prevents the development of electric vehicles. Seniors and people with disabilities represent a huge demographic. How can we include the disabled community in the Green New Deal? Any takers? Well, Mark, you could have called me personally, oh. but um, look, that's a, that's a very difficult question. Um, and what it's about, in my opinion, is we need to educate. We need to educate our riders. We need to educate our workers. We need to educate politicians. You know, a year and a half ago, before I got into this role, I heard climate change. I heard Green New Deal, but I never really dived deep into what that really meant. Um, and it was with my staff and by getting involved and understanding those effects of what climate change is looking like that we can then build our action um, to satisfy what we need to get done. But there's going to have to be some tough dialogue uh, for Mark Beeching and Handy Dart in Vancouver. It's about putting language within our collective agreements that addresses a Green New Deal and a just transition from, you know, conventional buses and fossil fuel buses to electric electric buses and what that is going to look like in terms of our work, training our members on um, that transition. It's not easy, but we cannot sit on our hands and do nothing about this. 
I, Eric, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I want to say, I think there's, there's two pieces to this. What, one of them is uh, the switch off fossil fuels to electricity. Um, that actually is a big uh, driver, uh, a, good, a big reason to take uh, public transit from handy dart with paratransit, uh, buses, railways, all into the public service because we need to make a really big long-term investment in electrifying the system. Uh, you know, a bus depot with say handy dart, um, uh, they're going to need to be charged overnight. It's a multi-million dollar investment just to put the charging infrastructure in uh, for um, at a depot. And that's the sort of thing that's pretty hard for a, uh, a private company that only has a five-year contract to figure out, okay, we're going to put $40 million into, into charging infrastructure. It doesn't make sense if it's all short-term contracts. Um, I, I personally think that to electrify the rail line, that one of the most practical ways to do that is to nationalize the track um, in order to, to make this a government project. Uh, and maybe maybe leave the, the freight company still right, running their freight trains, but to bring the tracks into the public sector. But I also think for, for people with disabilities in the Green New Deal, it's really essential that we, um, not just in the words, but in the imagery that we use, we make sure that people with disabilities are being considered in, in every piece of this. Uh, uh, John did a really good job in pointing out that um, some of the buses that replace Greyhound, you know, new buses that these companies have bought for new routes don't have wheelchair lifts. Um, the one I rode on didn't even have uh, particularly good heat. Um, so anyways, I think, I think that this has to be woven into the Green New Deal. Thanks, Eric. And that kind of, uh, th this question comes from Amanda Oram and she says, the buses we have in BC embrace liquid natural gas as a fuel source. I don't want to see more fracking and I'm wondering what the reality of how we can get people moving with vehicles um, without using fossil fuels is. And I thought maybe that could dovetail with that last question. Yeah, um, I, I think it's really, uh, this is one of the problems we have in, in uh, BC in particular is that the government has been spin, spinning fracked gas as some kind of climate solution. Um, all the information we have, particularly coming out of Europe, is that um, these, uh, these gas buses um, using what they call natural gas are just as bad for the climate as um, diesel buses burning tar sands oil. Um, the electrification of, of transit is a, it's a huge issue. Um, I think one of the really interesting pieces of it is the, the potential return of the trolley bus um, as a battery bus. Um, uh, in particular, I've been, I did some research while I was in Europe, went to a conference and uh, a consultant from Berlin was up there and talking about how they thought that the most practical way of um, electrifying their bus fleet was to run uh, trolley bus wires, trolley wires like they have in Vancouver, um, but to uh, um, only be part of the route. to be battery buses charging as they drive. These, the technology is there, but um, I think only a few geeks like me really want to dig into the, to the fine details. The, I think the main point is though, is that we can do it and there's huge benefits, huge health benefits. Just the, the difference for me being in Vancouver, um, being on a diesel line and hearing a diesel bus go by or, or riding on one, just the, the, the difference in the noise for the people on the street or in the bus is just just amazing. And, and even, the, even the air quality on the street, where you have a lot of diesel or natural gas buses. It, it's just not a nice place to be. These buses, these electric buses, like we have in Vancouver, they make the city a lot nicer. Um, and that's what we can that's what we can do. We can do what we need to do and make our, our communities nicer places to be. Thanks, Eric. 
Um, let's see, we've got Steve and he says, how do you respond to those who insist that transit should pay for itself despite all public transit being subsidized everywhere in the world and highways and air travel being he heavily subsidized in their own right? Any takers? All right, well, let me give, it, let me give this a whirl. So transit is subsidized, but I will say this, in Canada, transit, public transit, is the least subsidized in all of North America. So that's a huge problem. When, if you look at comparables, when you look at New York City and so on and so forth, and we compare it to, for example, to the city of Toronto at 78 cent subsidy, in New York, it's like 250 a ride. Um, and what we need to do is uh, continue the current levels of funding, but we need some real investment from all levels of government. Um, and I said, we, we have to look at what is the cost of not doing these things? I, and I think that's the real issue here. Um, you know, how many of us have stood on the corner of, of, a, of a, an intersection as the diesel bus came by and started to accelerate and propel and you're sitting there and get a, a big breath of diesel in your mouth? Um, think of that every day and think of that by every vehicle. Uh, you know, again, money's always an issue, but I think the long-term issues here are that money shouldn't be the issue because it's an investment in our world. Um, and, you know, maybe they, instead of giving all this money to private contractors and, and, and their subsidies, take that money and reinvest it in our own people, in our own country, and let's move to where we need to. And that's a Green New Deal with a just transition for Canadians. Thanks, John. And while you're with us, we have a question directed specifically at you. It says, are you familiar with the Save SDC group in Saskatchewan waiting for the provincial election, get rid of the con Sask party, NDP, Bailey says they would reinstate STC if they're elected, will be a tough battle to win. I'm not sure if, what the question is, aside from if you're familiar, but go ahead. And so um, I am familiar with it. My staff has been briefing me on it, and we are going to be doing some groundwork in Saskatchewan leading up to the provincial election, and we will be uh, reaching out to some of those groups to do some advocacy work to see if we can build a dialogue and momentum on, on reinstating STC or some derivative of it to bring back inner city transit to that province. Thanks, John. Um, so we're just about to move on to the part where we give folks an opportunity to get involved. But before we do, do any of our panelists have any parting words? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to bring up one issue that um, is, uh, is the question of economic development in, in rural areas, because it quite often gets left out with the, like the question of subsidies. That's just, you really can't have uh, a developed economy, a diversified economy, if people can't get to and from your, your small city or town. Uh, and that's one, I think that's going to be one of the crucial things is if we can get some of the smaller communities that are, that are not booming, um, behind this proposal on a national basis because they want to be able to have a diversified economy. That's one of the things that I think can, can tip this. Great, thanks, Eric. All right, so over to you, Dylan, to talk about next steps for working on these issues. Thanks so much. And and just uh, quickly as well, in, in relation to to one of the, the questions that, that came up, and the, this comes up about the Green New Deal in general as well, is that, that question of how are you going to pay for it? And, and, and really, as was, was touched on, it's a question of priorities. And 
there's all kind of sp uh, spending and subsidies that happens uh, when it comes to the fossil fuel industry and military spending and at the municipal level, uh, police budgets and, and a, a range of other things, not to mention all the, the money that corporations are, are hoarding in, in offshore tax havens. So, so it's, it's not a question of how do we pay for it? The money is there. It's, it's really, what do we want to prioritize in the kind of world we want today and, and tomorrow? And so, so the question for us here uh, right now in, in this uh, webinar and, and in the organizing we're doing generally moving forward is, is what's next. What can we do uh, together collectively to, to change uh, what we're talking about? And, and so we wanted to get a sense from, from you. Are, are you interested in, in working on these issues that we've been uh, talking about? Are, are you interested in working on uh, transportation issues in, in general, including uh, the, the urban campaigns that folks are working on, including uh, uh, in, uh, better service uh, for suburban communities, in, including highway bus service. Uh, we want to hear from you what kind of work you're you're interested in doing, or or may already uh, be doing, so we can start to make some some connections between folks in in different uh, communities. So we wanted to take a, a moment here, nearing the end of, of this webinar, to talk about next steps and and uh, what kinds of uh, actions we can uh, commit to together to work on this to to build. Uh, locally to build power, to build across movements, and, and to build action to, to bring about the, the change that we need and to bring about uh, a Green New Deal that, that includes the, uh, key key uh, commitments and, and key ways forward on uh, public uh, transportation. So so we'll, I, I think we'll, we'll open it up a, a little bit more before we wrap up to, to hear from, from others on, uh, on the webinar and, and the audience here. So feel free to just jump into the Q and A if you have some some thoughts on on any of uh, of that, and and we can take it from there. There's also the chat, Dylan. If people yeah. want to type to everyone, yeah, that totally works too. That might work a little bit better, so everyone can see what you're saying. And then, real quickly, uh, Dylan, if folks are wanting to get involved and move forward, but they don't have anything to say right now in the chat, how who should hmm. they be getting in touch with to do that, and how? Yeah, yeah, uh, people can uh, go to Canadians.org/slash Green New Deal, and we also have the the organizing guide there for the the Green New Deal Communities Campaign. Uh, if you haven't already seen it, it's it's a good primer to get you started on a local organizing, and, and there there's a, a number of things in there around transit and and transport as part of the, the kind of local Green New Deals that we can be uh, building in our communities. And you can also email us uh, directly at greennewdeal at canadians.org and we'd be happy to, to follow up with you and, and talk further uh, beyond just today about what we can do uh, together to move things forward. And folks, if any of you are wanting to type something in the chat, you just mouse over the bottom of your screen. There's a little conversation bubble there that says chat. And once you click on that, you'll see it open up on the right side of your screen. So let's see, we've got um, Penny. Hi, Penny, saying, um, getting involved with politicians directly, joining writing associations, meeting with them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's in response to work that can be done. Yeah, and there's a question about uh, material made up uh, around transit uh, for for city and town officials. Definitely something we're we're looking uh, into, as well as around other key issues like housing and and uh, there's there's quite a few. So definitely, uh, in addition to transit, if there are other key materials that would be helpful, we can definitely look at uh, what might be possible. And, and also just to add, uh, there are in a number of communities, uh, Green New Deal coalitions that either exist or are coming together. So there, there are uh, increasingly spaces where, where you can work with others across uh, issues uh, on, on local uh, Green New Deals that can include uh, transportation as well as uh, other issues. And uh, Gordon's just uh, pointing out that Climate Justice Toronto, Toronto is doing a lot of uh, youth organizing for, for free and expanded transit in conjunction with groups like Free Transit Toronto, TTC Riders, Jane and Finch Action Against Poverty, uh, QP2 and others, yes, definitely. And, and similar initiatives are, are happening in, in a number of uh, communities. And, and worth uh, noting as well that amalgamated uh, transit union locals are involved in a number of those urban campaigns as well, since uh, ATU, in addition to, to representing uh, highway bus service operators, as, as was mentioned, uh, represents uh, urban transit workers as, as well. 
and Steve's uh, from Transport Action Canada and, and just uh, uh, advocating for public transport and highway bus service is definitely of interest to them. So that's great. And uh, Saraya, uh, Saraya is, is uh, saying it's important to work on provincial as well as federal governments because a lot of good things can begin with one province, uh, definitely. And, and we're very much looking at the, the municipal and community work that we're doing at the council as a way of providing upward pressure towards uh, potential provincial uh, Green New Deals uh, as well. And there, there are a few uh, few places where folks are organizing on, on that as well. And uh, Mark's saying that handy dart workers with ATU 1724 uh, are approaching the provincial government in order to include paratransit in, in the Green New Deal and would like to, to network with a larger federal campaign. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, let's follow up on, on that. There are a number of uh, other intersections when it comes to, uh, when it comes to disabilities as, as well. There, there's, uh, when it comes to uh, snow clearing, it, it may seem on, on the face of it totally un, unrelated, but uh, it is uh, is the case that in, in many uh, communities in, in North America and Canada, uh, uh, snow clearing on roads is prioritized over uh, sidewalks, which has disproportionate impacts on, on women and people with disabilities since uh, roads are predominantly uh, uh, drive, uh, single occupancy vehicles uh, tend to be uh, driven more by men and, and public transit it tends to be uh, driven more more by women and in a number of places in Europe, for example, where they've flipped that on, on its head, it's had a very positive uh, uh, impact on, on uh, mobility for, for women and, and people with, with disabilities and, and uh, factoring in those kinds of uh, pedestrian dimensions when it comes to the overall looking at how people get around as, as part of transportation is really a key part of it as well. And that's just part of how we can uh, be working together uh, with a larger uh, network of people working in communities from, from coast to coast around uh, these kinds of issues across movements. And Amanda is saying uh, Nanaimo has an environmental sustainability uh, committee that's listening to how they can implement to, to aspects of, of a Green New Deal. So for folks in, in Nanaimo, uh, definitely uh, worth uh, keeping that in mind. And uh, just noting the the time, I just wanted to, to open it up to as well to, to Eric or, or John, if you had any uh, thoughts on, on any of what's uh, come up so far in terms of uh, in terms of organizing. Well, um, let me start by saying this. You know, um, a year and a half ago, we didn't have much capacity in organizing. Um, we are forever working uh, in developing new relationships with community groups and, and advocacy groups on this. Um, if you're listening, please reach out to ATU Canada. You can email us at office at atucanada.ca. We want to hear from your groups. We want to try to partner with you. We want to put footprints for ATU right across this country and build those relationships so that we can influence the decision makers. You know, we're 34,000 members, but if we could take, you know, 10% um, of our riders to jump on board, no pun intended here with ATU Canada, we could very quickly build um, a huge base that's going to drive and make political decisions more difficult uh, for those politicians uh, and start to position ourselves um, by influencing how they make those decisions. Look, um, it's not gonna be an easy road. We're a long way away from getting to where we wanna be, but we're up for the challenge. Uh, please visit us um, again on our website. And I wanna take this opportunity um, to thank you guys for having us um, on this webinar today. Uh, we'd love to participate in more of them. And we wanna work with all groups across this country to make a change. Awesome. Thank you so much, John and Eric. And thank you both for the work you're doing. And Dylan, you as well. Thanks for joining us. And thanks everyone for joining us. I put uh, the website um, for the Canadians, uh, the Council of Canadians Green New Deal work in the chat section. Again, for any of you who are listening at home, that is canadians.org slash Green New Deal. And you can also email, email us at greennewdeal at canadians.org.
And I think that brings everything to a close, but we will, um, we do have a recording of this if any of you would like to see the whole thing, who just got in touch or who would like to show your friends. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody.